Okay, next we'll take a look at some of the protozoa. Protozoa are a uh, very, very, very diverse group of organisms. From chapter one, these are, uh, if you remember from chapter one, I talked about these and I discussed them being very difficult to kind of pigeonhole or describe in a very general sense. They're so broad. It's kind of like someone saying, describe an animal. And you'd have to say, okay, well, what kind of animal? Because there's lots of different types of animals, right? So protozoa are kind of the same way. They're, there's so many different types. So to start off here, 65,000 species. These are generally found in soil and water as the most common habitant. So they're not as ubiquitous as other organisms. You don't necessarily find these floating through the air. You wouldn't necessarily find these just scattered about any random place. They tend to concentrate in soil and water. But in those areas, they're pretty, pretty numerous. Lots and lots and lots of them. Um, most are free living and harmless. However, those that do cause infection tend to cause a fairly significant amount of infection in certain areas especially. So malaria is an example. Although we don't experience it here in North America, malaria is a parasite that inflicts, inflicts millions of people each year and can cause uh, upwards of a million deaths each year. Real quick about this middle paragraph here. The taxonomy of protease is expected to change over the next so many years and, and so we don't really get into taxonomy here, so it's not really a concern. Uh, I think in the past I had gotten into taxonomy, which is why I had mentioned that there. But um, anyway, uh, they're a complicated group, and they're trying to reclassify them to make it a little more consistent. But that's not, don't worry about that paragraph there. Next, I want to talk about how to classify some of the protozoa, just to give you an idea of some of the different types. So this is kind of a way to break them down a little bit and at least give you an idea of what are some of the more common types. So it would be kind of like saying uh, reptiles versus mammals versus birds, that kind of thing. So we're kind of putting them in these kind of very broad categories to give you just kind of a basic idea of what are some of the most common types. So in this case, they, they group them by their ability to move, so modal groupings. So we have really four groups, three of which are actually based on motility, and one is then actually defined as a based on a lack of motility. So you have motility being uh, the characterizing feature of these three, and then a lack of it being the characterizing feature of the four. So you, the first one are called pseudopods. It's pronounced pseudopod. Pseudo means false. Pod, pod, or podia means foot. So this stands for false foot, and that has to do with how they move their cell membrane. This is actually what we talked about in chapter five, part one, where I showed a video of the uh, microfilaments or the actin filaments pushing a cell, and I talked about cell crawling. This is actually how the pseudopods move through cell crawling. Flagellates use a flagella. We talked about a flagella. And ciliates use a cilia. We talked about those as well. And then the, the last group down here, the AP complexa, they're defined by a lack of motility. And another interesting characterization about them is that they're all considered obligate endoparasites. So take the first part, obligate, meaning that they are always, and then parasites, take this part, they're basically always a parasite. So AP complexa are largely defined by the fact that they are always parasitic, whereas these other ones here sometimes are, sometimes aren't. And the other part, endo, means that they're always parasitizing inside of a cell. So they actually infect an organism inside of their cells, and that's how all of them cause infection, at least in some part of their life cycle. So real quick, let's look at a couple representations of these four, make a few quick drawings here keep this relatively simple. So the first one, the pseudopods, they tend to have a very irregular shape. And in fact, a lot of times people refer, although this is not always the case, but a lot of people may be more, may be more familiar with the term uh, amoeba. Amoeba is an example of a pseudopod. And just to give you an idea, this is what amoeba looked like. The way, and here's a picture even showing a pseudopod. The way that this works, for, so first of all, amoeba have a very irregular shape. They tend to be drawn kind of like a blob, kind of like those pictures we're showing there. So they're just very irregular. But the way that they actually move is from the extension of the membrane. Again, this goes back to the first part of chapter five, if you want to refer back to that, or maybe you're skipping ahead. This isn't essential to understand it, but it helps if you go back to that. What they basically do 
is they extend out these actin filaments in an area that they want to move. So let's say, for example, they want to move in this direction. What they do is they extend out these microfilaments, and that actually pushes the membrane in that general direction. And so they end up then kind of contracting these, and ultimately what it does is it slides the membrane in this direction. And then on the back half here, they contract on this, on this side, and ultimately the organism kind of moves in that direction. And the term pseudopod derives from the term false pseudo, false foot podia, or pod stands for foot. And the idea is that someone thought it was uh, appropriate because when they extend this membrane out, it, I guess, looked like a false foot to somebody. So random naming, that's what they decided to call it. But that's because of the way they extend the membrane and, and kind of move outward. And so that's something you can kind of see here not really well. You'd have to go, you can find an animation I showed one, or a, a video that is, I showed that in the last uh, section there if you want to go back and look at that. Lots of interesting figures here of the amoeba. Um, next one are the flagellates. These are organisms with a flagella. We'll just draw a simple one here even though you kind of already know what these are. These are organisms with a flagella. Now in the chapter four, the prokaryotes, we talked about all the different flagella arrangements. We talked about monotrichus and amphitrichus and peritrichus. When it comes to the eukaryotes, there are so many different types of arrangements that we just really don't get into naming them quite like that. It, 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 naming systems are, are good when you have a handful of distinct types. When it comes to the eukaryotes, you don't have that. You have such a wide variety that it's no longer really appropriate to start trying to name those, especially in the introductory class because there'd be such a great number that it becomes much more complicated. So that, that's why we don't do that there. So just flagellates, organisms with the flagella. Finally, the ciliates. Ciliates are organisms with cilia. And these are organisms that um, utilize the cilia for movement in this case. So if you remember from the first part of chapter four, chapter five, sometimes they use these for filter feeding. So in this case, we're talking about how they use them for movement. So these are little hair-like extensions that occur all around the outside of the cell, like this. And just keep going. Those are the ciliates. The last one, the AP complexa, they're defined by a lack of motility. As I already mentioned, they're obligate endoparasites. And essentially what they have evolved to do is utilize other organisms for their movement. So they don't have their own motility because they tend to infect other organisms and then use those organisms to spread themselves around. Here you see a picture of the malaria parasite, uh, um, which is a, an example of an AP complexin. And this isn't necessarily the best figure, but it's showing some of the different life cycles of the AP complexa. And you can see that they tend to focus around different cells within the human body, for example. So here they're bursting out of a cell, infecting a cell, bursting out of that cell. This would be where they infect the liver, break out of the liver cells, go on to infect red blood cells, break out of the liver, the red blood cells, and then go on. And this is where they would go on into a mosquito, not shown here, but they would complete their life cycle in a mosquito where they would reproduce through meiosis and then go on to infect uh, through the bite of a, of a human. Here's the mosquito, not very well clearly shown, but a mosquito biting the human and reinfecting. So their life cycles tend to revolve around infecting cells and then breaking out and going on to infect more cells. Um, when it comes to the protozoa, they have a lot of complicated life cycles. Looking at that last one there, you see a variety of different life stages. But protozoa can be broken down into two general life categorizations, two life stage categorizations. One is called the trophozoite life stage, and the other is called a cyst life stage. If you refer back to chapter four, part two, we talked about the um, bacterial endospores. And we talked about the vegetative life cycle, and the, the, the spore life cycle, uh, uh, stage that is, the vegetative stage and the spore stage. 
this is very similar in a lot of ways. The, so the trophozoite is a lot, in a lot of ways kind of like the vegetative stage, the active or modal feeding stage. And the cyst in a lot of ways is like the endospore, where it's dormant and resistant. Uh, also a, kind of like a seed. So the cyst is a life stage that allows it to survive in the environment in order for the conditions to be favorable. And this trophozoite is the life stage that actually moves around and goes on to infect and acquire food. So it's a lot like the seed in the cyst stage and the active adult stage in the trophozoite. Uh, being able to form the cyst makes them able to resist harsh environmental conditions. Now these are not as survivable as the endospores. Endospores are much more difficult to kill, but they're comparable in that it does help them survive certain unfavorable conditions like low water, low nutrients, high levels of heat, things like that. Cysts can, uh, can really kind of help them survive until the conditions become favorable again. It talks about that down here in this last paragraph. Here's a figure out of your textbook showing that. Here's a trophozoite stage. It tends to, uh, uh, so, so as an example here, it's drying up, lack of nutrients, so the environment is becoming less favorable. So what it does is it starts to kind of form almost like a cocoon around itself. It starts to kind of wall itself in, and this is where it starts to form the cyst here, kind of uh, shelling itself up, so to speak. This allows it to survive harsh conditions. Here you see the, the cyst is fully formed. And then if the conditions become favorable again, moisture, nutrients, things like that return, it'll break out of that cyst stage and return back into the trophozoite stage. So these life cycles just revolve basically around favorable and unfavorable conditions. So when it's unfavorable, low nutrients, low water, goes into the cyst. When it becomes favorable, pops back out, goes into the trophozoite stage. And this here is actually a real image showing a cyst here and the trophozoite emerging from that here. On this slide, I've just got a couple examples of some important protozoa pathogens. We'll talk about these in the lab later on in the semester. So for now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with these, but this is a few things uh, of examples here. One is an example, uh, or two examples rather, of a, of a pathogenic flagellate. One is a, one that causes a disease called Chagas disease. Another is called African sleeping sickness. So they're, they're fairly different diseases, but they're both caused by a flagellated parasite uh, called trypanosoma. And we'll actually look at a similar species of trypanosoma, a cousin to these, uh, in the microscope later in the semester in the lab. But these are examples of a pathogenic flagellate. And let's take a look here from the web at what these look like. And soma. Here you can see these are kind of a flagellated type looking protozoa. So here you can see the flagella. I think that, that looks like a drawing. Here we go. These look like real high resolution images here. There's some red blood cells. Here are the, uh, uh, the trypanosomas themselves. This is more like what we're going to see under the microscope, more of a two dimensional low resolution microscope image. But here again are the, the trypanosomes and these are red blood cells in which they're swimming around. So they're bloodborne pathogens and when they take samples of these they tend to take them from infected animals uh, in a blood sample which is why you typically see them swimming around in blood. Here's a better uh, illustration with more detail here of what these look like. So those are examples of some flagellated pathogens. Uh, an example of an amoebic amoeba pathogen or a pseudopod pathogen is one called Intamoeba histolytica. Intamoeba histolytica is one that tends to cause infection through food and water contamination. Here's some images of Intamoeba. Here's a microscope image of Intamoeba. Here's one showing this trophozoite in the cyst. It's a drawing, obviously. Here's some images of a variety of different forms. Looks just like kind of like a more of a circular amoeba. So nothing real special. I think that's, I'm not, I don't know, that's a computer animation there. Um, but uh, it's amoeba is one that is strictly a human pathogen and it tends to come from fecal contamination. So some people are infected and they shed it through the feces which gets into the environment and can be picked up from contaminated water or contaminated crops. 
So while it's not common here in North America, it is somewhat common in Central America and other parts of the world. Let's see if we can find Intamoeba histolytica. Uh, find that throughout the world. Here we go. Here's uh, showing uh, areas where it is more common. So in the uh, dark green there are areas where it is more common. So only in certain parts of Central America down here. Uh, in the lower parts of Central America. Um, uh, up here in the northern parts of North America, Africa, places like that actually is more common. So not something that we really ever see here, but something that is uh, somewhat common in other parts of the world. And then we talked about malaria already. Malaria is an example of an AP complex in parasite. And then what I'm going to have you read about here on, in one of the online articles is one called toxoplasmosis. Uh, bacteria, or ba the bacteria, or the uh, Protozoa is called Toxoplasma gondii, that is, and it causes the disease Toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is one that you can actually get from infected cat feces. And here they show a picture of a cat because it tends to revolve around the life cycle of cats. But the trophozoite in this case is what's infective and can get into the body and potentially cause infection. This is one that doesn't usually cause infection unless you have a weakened immune system. So typically you can be infected as a healthy individual and not typically have any symptoms according to most research and uh, only if someone has a very severe immune compromising condition. It's fairly common for, or not, at least it was common at one point for people who had HIV and AIDS to uh, potentially develop. It was called toxoplasmosis of the brain. Let's see if we can find a picture of that. Uh, they're just showing brain scans here. But toxoplasmosis of the brain, I'm assuming that's what that's showing here, would occur in someone who typically has a very weak or no immune system. Usually, uh, I'm most familiar with it when, with people who have untreated HIV and AIDS. Ultimately, the infection migrates to the brain and, and, and can cause pretty serious issues there. Now, the other area that toxoplasmosis can be a problem is in pregnant women. And if you've ever been expecting or had a child, you may have been told by your doctor or others to avoid cleaning the cat box. And that's because cats are the carriers, or not, not the only source of it, but they're what we call the uh, what we call the definitive host of the parasite. And what that means is that they're able to allow the, the parasite to reproduce. So they're the ones that shed active uh, the active cysts and the active uh, parasite in their feces. And they say that if a pregnant woman is to become infected with toxoplasmosis for the first time during a pregnancy, it might actually migrate into the placenta and cause pretty serious issues with the developing fetus, anything from um, genital defects or even potentially death, stillbirth. Um, so for someone who's, who's pregnant or expecting, toxoplasmosis is more of a concern than somebody who otherwise would be perfectly healthy and have a normal immune function. Otherwise, it's not usually an issue. And from my understanding, it's pretty rare, even for, an, for a, a woman who's expecting to actually get infected with the toxoplasma parasite. But something that you would want to be aware of if you are expecting, you typically just want to avoid any kind of contact with cat feces. Not like you have to be told that anyway. But that just basically means cleaning the cat box and washing your hands really good if you happen to do that. Okay, last group that we'll talk about here are called the helminths. Helminths are parasitic worms, and they tend to come in one of three forms, tapeworms, flukes, and roundworms. The, and there's actually really kind of two major groupings here, which are the flatworms, which include tapeworms and flukes, and then the nematodes, which are roundworms. So the term platyhelminth is a, uh, is a more technical word term to describe flatworms, and the term nematode is a more technical term to describe roundworms. In fact, these are actually uh, animal groupings. These are some of the uh, major animal phylum that these are listed within. So what I want you to know are what are the three types and what are the two major groupings and what are the different types of groupings being recognized. Platyhelminths or flatworms, nematodes or roundworms. I won't make you spell those, but just be able to recognize them in the multiple choice. So here we see examples of some of the flatworms. This is a tapeworm. This is uh, over here is a a drawing illustration. 
and over here this is a real image they tend to be segmented but have a flat body so they can kind of grow through addition of segments and uh, you have what's called here a scolex which is the head which attaches to the intestinal lining and then it, as it absorbs nutrients it grows through the addition of segments and they continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and more disgusting and they can get really really big I think the largest one on record is something like 90 feet or something like that it's something crazy so uh, not usually that get that big but they can fairly get fairly large if given an opportunity uh, drugs will easily kill these some uh, um, uh, deworming medications will easily uh, eliminate those very rare and people somewhat common in dogs and, and cats we'll talk about those here in a second over here is another type of flatworm these are called the trematodes or the flukes and they consist of, consist of it's a single body uh, shape here that is flat and almost looks like a leech kind of has a, a mouth like opening that they absorb nutrients through these are all real images believe it or not of uh, various types of, of worms here. This is a round worm. This is a round worm here. These down here are tapeworms. So these are close-up images down here of the scolex of the tapeworm. Going back here, this is what we're looking at here. That's just a, a drawing. These are high-resolution microscope images of what those look like up close from a couple different species here. So you can see a couple different types. We don't have the name of the species here, but, but there's a variety of different tapeworms. They're all very similar, but they have slightly different anatomical features. So you can see, I, think, I believe this is like the pork tapeworm here, I believe. And I believe this is the uh, dog or cat tapeworm here, I think. Uh, interestingly, these, these here don't actually absorb nutrients through their mouth, through the scolex. They just use that to attach. They just use it to grip onto the intestinal lining. And then they actually absorb nutrients across their body. They actually use diffusion and osmosis to suck in nutrients across their body. The roundworms actually have a true opening, a mouth here, which looks fairly devilish, but they actually grip on to the intestinal lining and they actually do suck in nutrients through their mouth like you might expect. They're actually one of the first organisms to have a complete digestive tract, meaning they take in nutrients through the mouth and expel waste through the anus. They're one of the first organisms to actually have a complete system in which nutrients go in one direction and come out the other. Many organisms below them in the uh, animal world, less, de less developed, less advanced organisms like the tapeworms, which are, which are less de developed, more primitive, they actually don't have that. And they, they essentially just suck in nutrients through across their body and then expel waste in a similar kind of way. The helmets tend to revolve around three life stages. And these are the egg, the larvae, and the adult. So the egg is typically where you get infected. That's typically a microscopic structure that is ingested through food or some other type of contaminating material. The egg will develop into a larvae, which will then go on to develop into an adult, typically somewhere in the intestinal lining. The egg is usually what allows it to get into your body. The egg will survive the digestive acid in your stomach, at least theoretically, and will then develop inside the small intestine or even the large intestine where there's less of a harsh environment where they can survive there. Many of these are considered hermaphrodites, meaning they have both male and female reproductive organs and they can mate with themselves, essentially. They don't necessarily need a mating partner to reproduce. And so if you get a single worm with inside you, they can go on to produce more and theoretically reinfect the same host over and over again. Many of these types of organisms have complex life cycles. I misspelled that word there. Take the E off that. But many of them have complex life cycles where they can actually go through multiple hosts. Sometimes they go into one host, but sometimes they'll actually go through a series of hosts. I'll go th give you an example of that here in just a second. So where they have multiple hosts, they'll typically have at least two, in which one is referred to as the definitive and the other is referred to as the intermediate. The intermediate host is typically where larval development occurs, and it's usually where the egg develops into the larvae. And at some point then what they have to do is actually exit the intermediate host and then go on to infect what's called the definitive host. And this is where adulthood and mating take place and where the eggs are shed and then go on to restart the life cycle over again. Kind of crazy how that works, but they actually have developed these very complex life cycles over many years of evolution. Most of them still revolve around those today. Not, not all but a good deal of them do, 
and I'll give you an example of one of those here in a second. So an example is from one of the more common types of tapeworms called Diphyllidium caninum, more commonly known as the dog or cat tapeworm. So if you have a dog or cat, and if they've ever had tapeworms, then there's a good chance this was the species that they had, very likely, the most likely uh, species that they would have picked up. Now, the way this typically works is that the egg in the larvae goes to the intermediate host, which is actually a flea. So the intermediate host is the flea. Now I'll find, I'll give you a, a diagram of this here in just a second, but go ahead and write that down for now. The intermediate host is the flea, F-L-E-A. What organisms can serve as the definitive host? Well, typically it's either dogs or cats, but it could also be people, very rarely. But typically it's dogs or cats, and, and that's mostly just because those are the most common types of organisms that we have uh, close to us that tend to get fleas. So, so there actually could be a wide variety of other organisms, but rather than list all of them, we'll keep it to one of the most common. I pulled up a figure here on the web to show us this, and here's that figure. So here's a dog, and what happens is, is the dog picks up an infected flea. And this is kind of like a chicken and the egg thing here. So what you want to draw, and I'll, I'll draw this with you here, what we want to draw, you can just write this actually, right? Just dog slash cat, or you can get fancy and draw a picture there. And what we're going to show then is starting here with an, so we're assuming that we're starting with an infected animal, okay? And again, it's kind of like a chicken and the egg scenario where what came first, we don't know exactly. But as we see it today, the way it works today, if we were to go out and explore as of right now, we see that there are infected animals, such as dogs, and, and they have adult tapeworms inside their intestinal tract. Those, those tapeworms will shed eggs that come in the form of what's called a proglottid. So if you're eating, stop. And proglottids look, oops, proglottids. Here we go, that's what I'm looking for. This is a tapeworm proglottid, not as gross as I thought actually. But this is actually part of the segment of the worm that contains the eggs inside of it here. So this is actually uh, a, a part of the tapeworm that contains the, the eggs within it. And what's gonna happen is that these are actually going to break off and then crawl outside of the animal. And when that happens, they're fairly disgusting. That's what I was looking for. Here's one. They tend to look like little, uh, like little grains of rice or like little inchworms. They actually crawl and move. Here's another picture of them. Uh, if you've ever had a dog or cat that has these, one of the easiest ways to tell is if you look near their back end, you'll typically see these little white looking things that look like little grains of rice near their back end. Let's see if we can find. Okay, so here's a better view of what those would look like on your dog or cat. I'm sure you love me for this. Uh, close up here, oh, that doesn't look like a high resolution. Um, here's a picture. Uh, they tend to look like this around the back end. All right, moving on, you get the idea. Here's a picture of a, another picture of the egg itself. This has got usually somewhere around 12 to 15 different eggs within it. So the proglottid breaks out from the dog, or it could be a cat. Where am I at here? And here, here's what that's showing. And then ultimately, here's what has to happen. It actually has to be picked up by a flea larvae. So flea have their own life cycles, and one of the things that they do is they go through a larval stage that actually looks a lot like a worm, kind of like a, uh, um, almost like a, um, uh, a butterfly larvae. And they actually feed off of the tapeworm eggs. And what they do is they eat the eggs and when they eat the eggs, that actually allows the egg to develop into uh, the next life stage within the flea larvae. So essentially you shed the egg and the flea larvae eats the eggs and that actually allows the, the tapeworm to develop inside the flea larvae, which I know that sounds really totally unbelievable, 
But this is actually where we come back to what I said earlier about the de intermediate and the definitive host. So what's, in the, what, what's happening is the, the definitive host is the animal which is shedding the egg. So in, the, in our example here, it's the dog. So the dog is shedding the eggs, and the intermediate host is the flea, which is actually picking up the eggs during its larval stage. And what ends up happening is the flea larvae and the tapeworm are actually developing simultaneously. And as the flea goes on to develop into an adult flea, the tapeworm is actually going on to develop further inside that flea gut. Now, in order for the tapeworm to complete its life cycle, what has to happen is an infected flea has to actually be swallowed by another animal, like a dog or cat. That actually allows the tapeworm developing inside the flea to get back inside that animal, migrate down into the intestinal lining, and develop further where it can start the process over again. So pretty crazy how that works. You essentially have a dog or cat that's shedding infected, uh, shedding uh, eggs, and then just by chance a flea has to, uh, a flea larvae has to eat it, and then go on to the itself be eaten by another animal. You might think, well, what are the odds of that? Well, individually speaking, they're not very good. But when it comes to tapeworms and fleas, they both proliferate in very, very large numbers, and they tend to shed thousands and thousands of eggs and on a routine basis. Fleas themselves can go on to produce thousands of eggs, and the tapeworms can produce thousands of eggs. And it only takes one of those coming together in order for that to happen. And so while the odds of any individual being successful are pretty low, they kind of compensate in volume. And they put out massive amounts of these. And so just by chance alone, one of them is successful, and that typically is all it takes to start the life cycle over again. These are actually more common in cats because cats are more prolific groomers, and they're actually more likely to eat the flea than a dog is, and so t cats tend to be more common that, that they are more likely to swallow an infected flea than a dog, although they both can obviously do it. Uh, as a side note, if you've, if you've got fleas, it's usually just a matter of time before your animal will develop tapeworms, and that's usually the way that works. So if you have a flea problem long enough, eventually you'll get tapeworms. And if you have a dog or cat that has tapeworms, odds are they either currently have fleas or have had fleas in the past. And that's uh, kind of a general rule of thumb that those tend to go hand in hand. A couple more notes here. Worms are pretty rare in the U.S. outside of our pets. It's pretty uncommon for people to pick them up. However, in different parts of the world, these are significantly more common. Uh, so outside of the U.S., they are... Uh, fairly common in, in third world nations, although in the first world nations like, like the United States and others, they're pretty uncommon. Interesting side note, there's been a lot of research that has started to indicate that worms may actually be a natural way for the body to suppress allergies. This is a kind of an odd thing, so to untease it just a little bit here, worm infections were thought to be fairly common, almost normal, for a huge part of human development and, and evolution. Looking back in history, there's lots of evidence to suggest that most animals would have had worm infections, including humans, throughout early parts of development. Today we still see the same thing. In many parts of the world, many animals carry worms on a routine basis. So, so worm infections are only uncommon by today's standards where we have become more hygienic and we have drugs and, and hygiene methods to prevent them prevent us from being infected so it's only been in recent history is the point that we've actually largely eliminated worm infections from the modern world research is actually suggesting that while that may be good in some ways there may be actually unintended consequences and it turns out that our immune system may actually have some benefit by having a worm infection present. It turns out we actually have immune cells and even antibodies that are designed to target worm infections primarily. And because they were so common at one point, the theory is that our, our immune system developed a whole mechanism to target these types of worms. The idea behind this is that when we, went, when we eliminated worms, we now left a part of our immune system with essentially nothing to do or at least much less to do in the absence of what was a, at one point a very common infection. So what they think is that given the absence of the more primary problem of worms, parts of our immune system have gone on to become more reactive and end up becoming triggered by less serious 
factors such as pollen and dust and, and smaller uh, allergens. And, and this is evident in the fact that people who have worm infections rarely, if ever, have allergies. They noticed this when treating worm infections in, in third world countries. They found that prior to treating the worms, that these kids, they would never have allergies, but that, and that was never really something that they paid attention to until they started to treat the children. And then they found that in a large number of them, after treating them, they would start to develop allergic symptoms. So this was recognized over and over again that they started to come up with this idea that worms and allergies might actually coexist. Since then, they've found lots and lots of evidence. If you type this in in Google, you'll find um, all sorts of different types of all sorts of different types of papers and uh, proposals on this. Uh, could worms in your gut cure allergies? Got allergies? Blame parasites? Future worm therapy? Why parasites may be good? I'm going to try and come up with a new online article for this, but uh, this is uh, still a lot of information here yet to be worked out. We'll talk about some of this in a little more detail, I'll at least bring this back up later when we talk about uh, the immune system. But there's actually some pretty specific links to certain types of cells in our immune system, and, and this is all fairly well um, proposed based on kind of how the different parts of our immune system work. So basically the idea is that at one point our immune system was occupied. When we remove the worms, we essentially uh, um, free those immune cells up to react in other ways. and. Uh, Really, if you look at what an allergy is, it's your immune system gone awry. It's your immune system reacting to things that aren't harmful that only cause irritation. So your immune system is designed to kill things that are harmful and eliminate infection. And what's happening with an allergy is that your body is responding to something that's not harmful, but it thinks that it is, and ultimately ends up causing more discomfort than good. Things like pollen and dust aren't going to hurt you but they can trigger your immune system, which makes you irritated. And so that's kind of really what an allergy is, an inappropriate immune response. So that's kind of how these are thought to relate. Take away the worms, now your immune system is, is bored and starts to react to things that it shouldn't. Oversimplified explanation. But, but lots of research suggests that that could be true. And they're actually coming up with new ways of potentially treating allergies by using uh, different components of, of the worm as a way to maybe suppress that. You can look into that online if, that, if that's something that you find interesting. Okay, that's the end of Chapter 5. Uh, as always, let me know if you have any questions. Send me an email. Ask me questions in class. We'll go to Chapter 6 next where we talk about the viruses. Have a great day, and I will see you in class next time. Goodbye.